This morning the sermon is going to uh, be talking about personal evangelism. And I called it Personal Evangelism 101 because it's instruction from the master on how he did personal evangelism. Now, the reason that we need to go into this is this church is all about evangelism. Uh, if you are not aware of our mission statement, you'll find a copy of it on the wall in the, in the foyer there, and it is reaching out, and each of those letters stands for something. It's an acrostic that all are about reaching out to others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, as uh, John mentioned, we are going to begin uh, next week with uh, studies on how to give Bible studies. And uh, we have a, a, a wonderful set, brand new set, produced by uh, the, our pastor and his associates on um, how on the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is all Jesus-centered, and it is very, very good. So you are among the first people who will be able to utilize these studies in reaching out to others. Um, but uh, we're going to take a look at how Jesus did that. Now, in the book of John, in chapters 3 and 4, we have back-to-back uh, case studies of how Jesus reached out one-on-one -on -one to people. And these were two different kinds of people, Nicodemus and the woman at the well. And so he used two different methods, but there's a lot of similarities to them. I'm not going over both of them today. We're going to concentrate on the woman at the well. And I think it uh, begins with some really powerful words. But before we open the scriptures, let's just have another word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have cared so much about us, that you have called us from this world and to your eternal kingdom. Lord, we pray that you would put that burden on our hearts as well for others so that we can have company and uh, someone to bring with us when we come. Lord, we pray that you would uh, bless us and open our minds as we open the scriptures. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's open the Bible then to uh, John 4. I'm just breaking in a brand new Bible. Uh, my old one just wouldn't last any longer. It lasted 40 years, but it's... <laughs> John 4, verse 1. Now, therefore, when Jesus knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again unto Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Now, I want to stop there and kind of emphasize that because I see that uh, the King James Version certainly emphasizes that. And... The King James is my favorite of all the translations, even still. Um, it's worth the effort to try to understand the archaic language because the King James Version, above all other uh, much in use versions, that is, it um, tries to bring out the meaning of the Greek or the, or the Hebrew as closely as they possibly can. Now, I'm sure that if you have another version, it'll say something like, he needed to go through Samaria, or he had to go through Samaria. And it kind of leaves the impression, oh, well, I have to go through Samaria. And, and that is not the sense of 
of the Greek. In the Greek, he must needs. It is a, in the Greek, it's a binding necessity that he go through Samaria. And the reason that makes it interesting is because he did not have to go through Samaria. He could have gone around it like most of the Pharisees did. And a lot of other travelers went around it too because it was considered dangerous territory, particularly for Jews. Because the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along. And I think before we get into the story, I think we need to get a little historical background about who the Samaritans were and why the Jews hated them so much and why the Samaritans hated them back so much. When Israel was taken captive and into Babylon, they didn't take everybody. They just took... Uh, the uh, first of all, the the uh, first class people, the uh, the rich people, the educated people, and some of the rest of the people they left behind. And those people who were left behind uh, were Jews, but they began to syncretize with the. Uh, neighbor, neighboring uh, religions and they intermarried into uh, families and their sense of who they were began to diminish and they began to adopt the worship styles of their neighbors and they became uh, a, a different people. Just think about it though. They were there by themselves for 70 years while the rest of Israel was in captivity. I just want to ask you, if a group of people were taken out of our church in 1945 and came back today, would they recognize our religion? That's kind of what happened with the people who came back from Babylon was that they saw these people and they saw their faults. They didn't see so much their own faults, which they had plenty of, but they saw that these people were mixed and they considered that worse than being pagan because they had mixed God's religion with that of the pagans in society. And um, so when the Samaritans saw them come back, they at first rejoiced and saw, oh, our brethren are back and they're going to build the city and they're going to build the wall. We want to help. And the Jew says, no, we can't use your help. And so that started the conflict between the Samaritans and the Jews. Now Samaria was a area within uh, Israel that was between Judea and Galilee. And it was ill-defined. There were no borders, but it was generally accepted that in that area between those two was Samaria. And these people were considered untouchable by the Jews. And so most of the people, or the righteous people so-called, would go around Samaria. But it says very clearly here, he must needs go through Samaria. And I think that is an important thing for us to recognize about our mission in this world, is that it is a moral imperative that we go through Samaria. It is, you know, in Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, he says, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. 
That wasn't because somebody was holding a gun to his head. It was because he felt the urgent need to preach the gospel. And this is what Jesus felt as well. In 2 Corinthians 5.14, he's more particular about what it was that compelled him to preach the gospel. And here he says, for the love of Christ compels us. Notice it says the love of Christ, not the love for Christ. And I think that we need to pray, first of all, for love for Christ. And that is certainly part of our motive. But we also need the love of Christ. That is, the love that Christ had for this world. The love that will motivate us, that will move us to have this compulsion in our hearts to reach out to other people. And this is what is lacking primarily in the church today, is this burning desire if you have that love in your heart, you can't help but reach out to your neighbors. Secondly, the implication of he must needs go through Samaria is talks about a practical necessity. If you are going to reach the Samaritans, you're going to have to go through Samaria. Now, most of my friends are Adventists. That's because I hang out with Adventists. And I love Adventists, and I should. Um, but I need to broaden my circle if I'm really going to do God's will. I'm not, I don't think he's asking us to, uh, to have fewer Adventist friends or fewer Christian friends, but we need to also broaden our horizon and broaden our sphere of influence to reach those people who are around us. And there are many things uh, that are likable about them. Um, that is, if we are going to reach the lost. And, you know, we have a song, Seeking the Lost. But that's pretty uh, politically incorrect in these days. It's more correct to call people unchurched, which, you know, they're not lost. They're just unchurched. You know, they just don't happen to have a church. And that implies if they had a church, any church, then they're OK. And I think that, you know, our language means something. When we, when we use these phrases, it affects our thinking. We need to go back to really understand how Jesus saw people. If they did not have a relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, they were lost. And our neighbors are lost if they don't have a relationship with Jesus. And so we need this, this burning desire. We need this understanding of the importance of our job. One of the most devastating things that ever occurred to me was that if I don't do something because of my lack because of my actions or my lack of action, somebody else might be lost. It really hit me like a ton of bricks. And it is uh, something that we need to take to heart and to understand with all our being. We must needs go through Samaria. And then it goes on. In verse 5, then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Now this is the Old Testament town of Shechem. 
and the uh, and the language had just changed enough to change its pronunciation to Sychar. Um, and that's an interesting place. Uh, and I just mentioned a little bit of the history. In Genesis 26, 19 and onward, uh, it talks about how that well came to be there. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdsmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esilk, meaning contention, because they strove with him. And they digged another well, and they strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna, which means strife. And he removed from thence and digged another well. Um, the characteristic of Isaac is something that we could emulate. When um, they received unfair treatment from others, they went on and got on with things. When others claimed what was rightfully theirs, he did not uh, make that the center of his uh, religion. He just moved on and tried again and tried again. And finally, uh, they didn't strive for that one, and he called the name of it Rehoboth. And he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. And so this is a famous well, and it was right outside the city of uh, Sychar, which is Old Testament Shechem. Now, Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now, Jesus had been traveling probably about 20 miles uh, since the time he got up in the morning, and he got as far as Sychar, and it was midday, it was hot, the sun was shining down, and he was tired, and he sat on the well. But his disciples went on into the city to get provisions for their lunch and, and water. And... Um, but I don't believe that Jesus was more tired than the rest of them. I think he knew that he had a divine appointment in store for him. He was always looking for a divine appointment. And this is something that we can learn from Jesus. Wherever we go, whether we go to the drugstore or whether we go to the well or wherever it is, we're going to see somebody there that needs Jesus, and we are going to communicate to them uh, the words of life if we ask God for a divine appointment. Uh, it's something that we should do deliberately. We should, in the morning, when we have our prayers, ask God, please send someone to me today. And he generally will. It's interesting uh, that, uh, well, just a sidelight, that uh, the sixth hour was noon, but in those days an hour was not necessarily 60 minutes. An hour was uh, one twelfth of a day, uh, of the daylight. And so, it, the length of the day, the uh, length of an hour varied rather than uh, as we do it now. But he was there, so he'd probably been up for quite a while, and he got there, and he was tired. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. So now we see the master soul winner at work. Now, he knew something about her already. And if you think about it, you know something about her already too. Because she did not come to get her water in the cool of the morning like all the other women did. That was the social time of the day. That's when the women got together. 
to uh, draw water for their families and to share the news or the gossip or whatever. And they just had fellowship with each other there. And it was an opportunity they looked for. But this woman was not welcome in that company. She was not only a woman, she was a Samaritan. And not only was she a Samaritan, but she was a sinner. And here Jesus is sitting there and waiting for her. Now the first thing we see about her is the first stage in pretty much anybody's uh, uh, stages of uh, growth in uh, being reached. And that is a stage of indifference. She was indifferent to Jesus. She saw him there. She came anyway. He was just a Jew. He wasn't going to talk to her anyway. So she came and she was totally indifferent at this point. Now, in our society, when somebody is indifferent, we tend to leave them alone. In fact, that is probably one of the biggest faults of our culture that has crept into our church. And that is, uh, we don't um, want to impose on people. We don't want to uh, disturb them from where they are. And our whole society says, I'm okay, you're okay, everybody's okay the way they are. And so, you know, we don't need to reach them with the gospel. But Jesus didn't look at it that way. Now, how do you break indifference? Indifference um, is a challenging thing. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. And so many people are totally indifferent to God. They're totally indifferent to each other. And they're totally indifferent to themselves. And this woman was the epitome of that. She was indifferent to other people's feelings about her actions. She was indifferent to her own feelings about herself. Sometimes we call it tolerance. You leave me alone, and I'll leave you alone. Jesus said to her, give me to drink. It's interesting, Jesus always did the unexpected. We have this saying, what would Jesus do when we're supposed to behave as we think Jesus would behave? The problem with that is Jesus always did the unexpected thing. He never uh, did the thing that we would think that he would do. And uh, in this case, he did the very thing that he knew she expected him not to do, and that is speak to her. Not only did he speak to her, he asked her a favor. These are the Jews who refused the help of the Samaritans to build the wall. And here he was asking her for water. Now notice... He didn't ask her to paint, her, paint his house or to do something hard. He just asked for something simple. And it was considered an honor to give somebody water by the culture of that time. I don't know how we can necessarily implement this in our witnessing strategy. But, you know, sometimes we are so full of what we have to give people that we... Uh, Neglect to give them an opportunity to give of themselves. We, when you receive from somebody, you give them respect. And this is what this woman needed above anything else. She needed respect. And Jesus respected her. He spoke to her. He even asked her for water. Jesus was always interested in meeting people's needs. And I think we have 
some idea about what that means. When somebody has a need, we try to try to reach it. But you'll notice that often uh, what their need was was healing, and Jesus responded to that. Rarely did he respond to their need for money. Sometimes he did for food, but that didn't work out very well either because they found, he found them to be following him for the loaves and the fishes. He wasn't interested in developing a dependency class. What he was interested in reaching their real needs, the needs of their soul, the needs that really matter in life. They didn't need a sandwich. They needed a savior. Now this woman then, from this question, was raised to stage two of uh, the uh, search for Christ, and that is resistance and sp suspicion. And you may not think that that's an improvement over indifference, but it is. At least it's an acknowledgement that somebody's there, that they, they have provoked some thought in your mind. And so when you, when you have uh, an opportunity to witness and somebody uh, raises resistance or even suspicion with regard to your motives, um, that is still an opportunity to reach them for Jesus Christ. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now, he had given her something thought-provoking, something engaging. Um, but she saw something different in Jesus than she saw with most men. You know, I suppose she was used to men being interested in her for different reasons than what she saw in the eyes of Jesus. And so she was interested. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest two things, the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto me, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. And he stopped there. He didn't try to give her the whole Bible study all at once. He just provoked an interest. He said, I have something that you need. The gift of God. What is the gift of God? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But beyond that, the gift of God is um, knowing him, just being part of him, just belonging to him. And you know, this, this world has an aching desire to belong to something, to be part of something that means something. We try too often to dumb down religion to the point where it doesn't mean anything anymore. It's just, uh, you know, try to be good and, and say these words. And, and we don't try to make it a whole life experience. And who it is that saith unto thee, and this is life eternal, to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. The best thing that we can do for anybody is for them to be able to see Jesus through us and to know him because of their relationship with ourselves and with them. So then he, their uh, resistance and suspicion turned to curiosity, which is stage three. 
The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou this living water? Now Jesus didn't respond immediately to this. I suppose he just smiled because he knew that she knew that he wasn't referring just to the water that she was used to drinking. It was something deeper than that. So she went on with a challenge, which is stage four. You say you have something. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. Now she understood that he is talking about something of the crying need of her soul. And she had a need. You know, she was hardened. She was a longtime sinner. And she had gotten used to being that way. And so she probably presented to the world a toughened exterior. And you will find that among many of your contacts who are, are toughened. But everybody senses that they have a need of something. Everybody goes about this world, this life, with a, a God-shaped void in their soul that they can't identify it. So they try to seek it through popularity, or through money, or through power, or through fun, or through whatever pops into their head about how they might find this thing that will fill me, that will answer the crying need of my soul. This woman sought men. She thought maybe that was it. But it did not bring her this peace that she needed. And so when he offered to give her this water, she responded in the positive. And so Stage five is the desire stage, the stage of choice. And this woman made a choice, and she said, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. You know, I ask myself when I'm going through this, and when did salvation come to this woman? Is, um, does salvation come as a result of repentance? Or does repentance come as a result of salvation? Now, I really thought this through when I read the story of the prodigal son. When did the prodigal son become part of the family again. Was it when he got home and got all cleaned up or was it when he set his foot on the road home? And you know it says very clearly that the, the father saw him afar off and ran up the road to meet him and threw his robe around his shoulders. And you gotta ask yourself how far can God see and how fast can he run? The minute that we set our road, foot on the road to home, the soon as we accept the idea of salvation, he is there to greet us. And he throws the robe of righteousness around our filthy rags. Of course the cleanup process starts immediately thereafter. But salvation is our motivation for the Christian life. It is not the prerequisite for the Christian life. 
Repentance comes as a result of what God has done for us. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. And so it is that, that this woman accepted salvation. If he said that if you ask for this water, I will give it to you, then when she asked for it, he did give it to her. It's as simple as that. And so um, after this, and only after this, does the stage of conviction come into the picture. Immediately Jesus says, Jesus saying unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. And that saidest thou truly. Wow. Calling attention to her sin. That's certainly not politically correct in our day. But it is a necessity. In the book of Romans, which was written to people that Paul had not previously visited or written to, he starts out his uh, treatment of them with an iteration of all the sins in the world. And then he says, that is your condition. It's not only your condition. It's everybody's condition. And that is something that we need to understand about ourselves and about other people. Jesus came to save us from our sins. And, you know, we, we read Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But we often ignore Romans 6, 22, which is very clearly shows that holiness is part of the gift. Not only does he call us to eternal life, but he gives us the righteousness that makes that possible. It says holiness and in the end eternal life, if you look at Romans 6.22. And so when she received this little instruction about her sins, her immediate response is the one that you're going to run into too when you start talking about sin. Now I wouldn't try to point out somebody's particular sins to them. That's not your job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But to remind people that sin is our problem as human beings, that is always appropriate. But people will then resort to this, diversion in doctrinal issues or some other direction. In her case, it was doctrinal issues. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Always comes that, down to that, doesn't it? Worship, worship style. Now the uh, Samaritans felt better than the Jews because they saw that the Jews had pretty much a dead and dry religion and they had lots of life in theirs. Or at least they had lots of enthusiasm in there. Um, and the Jews uh, thought poorly of the Samaritans because there was so little truth in what they believed. And here Jesus answers in a, in a very important way. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh and now is, when ye shall neither in this mountain nor in Jerus yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. 
But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Now we need both, and people will swing either to one or the other, and they'll say that truth is more important than spirit, or spirit is more important than truth. I'd like to point out that spirit is not necessarily uh, an effusive uh, uh, style of worship. When it talks about spirit in the Bible, it's talking about a life principle. It is talking about the, the thing that drives a person's life. And it is uh, living and breathing your faith. It isn't just uh, going through certain machinations uh, during what we call a worship service. It is the life that one lives all during the week. It is the power that drives you. It is the breath. That's what spirit means. It is the breath of your life. And that's what Jesus was talking about. We need this living, breathing relationship with Jesus. And we need to know the truth. Amen. The worshipers of Baal had a lot of enthusiasm. But they were dead wrong. We need truth, and we should not be ashamed of the fact that we have the truth. Jesus was not ashamed to say that salvation is of the Jews. We should not be ashamed of saying that we have truth. We have the truth. Jesus is the truth. But we also have the truth as it is in the Bible At this stage, this woman had hope. At this stage, she had already accepted the water of life, and the Spirit was working in her and giving her hope. And she said, I know the when the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, when he is come, he will tell us all things. So she was asking a veiled question, and Jesus answered her. I can find my page. <laughs> Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. It's interesting to me that Jesus made the clearest declarations of his godness. He made the clearest declarations of his messiahship to individuals and not to crowds. You can say things to individuals that you can't say to crowds. You can say things in a way to individuals that you can't say to crowds. And in Jesus' case here, I noticed that he did a lot of talking, but he did a lot of listening too. And that's what you need to do when you're working with people on a one-to-one -one basis. Don't dominate the conversation. Give them time to respond. And uh, upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no man said, what seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? They were a little afraid of him because he knew. They knew that he'd give them a lecture if they did. But this is stage nine with the woman, acceptance. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, stage 10, witnessing. And look how well she learned from the master. Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Notice that she didn't tell them that this was the Christ. She asked them their opinion. That's a very important thing, I think, in this, in this whole thing. Because they weren't going to take anything from her. She was a sinner. 
But she said, this man told me everything I ever did. Do you think he's the Messiah? She knew he was. When we are dealing with people, don't have all the answers. Let people also respond with answers themselves. She said something thought-provoking and engaging. And she was obviously a different person by this time. Um, before this, she was hiding out. She was hiding from the, the neighbor. She came at noontime because everybody was taking a siesta then. That's the reason she came at noon. She didn't want to be seen. She didn't talk to the women and, and she talked to only certain men. And here she went out of her way. She left her water pot. It became unimportant to her. The things she was seeking before now were not important anymore. And she went and the first thing she did was witness to others, people who previously despised her. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Then therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Our church has been put on this earth to do the will of him that sent us and to finish his work. We, above all people, have an opportunity to reach out to others with the truth of God. And we need to have this motivation in us our meat and our drink is to do the will of him that sent us. He said, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white, all ready to harvest. And as they looked out on the fields, they saw the Samaritans coming. All with their white headdresses on. And it looked like a harvest of, of wheat coming across the fields. And they suddenly saw for themselves that everything they thought about the Samaritans was wrong. People need the Lord. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. Just wanted to point out that even with Jesus, there was a necessary follow-up to presenting the gospel. He didn't just drop it on them, get a decision, and move on. He nurtured them in. And this is something that we need to do as a church. And many more believed because of his own word and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that indeed the Christ, this is Christ, the Savior of the world. I just pointed out here that she did not get the credit that she necessarily deserved. They went out of their way to say, well, it wasn't what you said that got us. It was a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And I think that that is something that we need to understand when we witness. If we're in it for the credit, if we're in it for the recognition that we're going to get, if we're in it for even our own feelings of self-gratification, we're going to find that we will not find that. Because everybody who comes to Christ comes because of a decision of their own. This whole thing is about choice. We have a part to play, and we can facilitate that decision that they make 
but we are not the cause of their salvation. Jesus is the cause of their salvation. And their choice is the thing that makes the difference. We just need to make that opportunity available to them. Now, as John mentioned, we are going to begin in our church a thing on Sabbath afternoons after the fellowship meal. We are going to get together and we are going to study some lessons. These lessons will be important to us as we once again go over the steps to salvation. But they will be important to our witness to other people. And it is, it is important that we know what we are talking about when we reach other people. And so we will have these opportunities. I would earnestly recommend that you take advantage of this and that you will be here next Sabbath afternoon to, uh, to begin this wonderful study. God is doing something in our church. It is ever so evident to me. God's hand has been on this church since its inception. We've had miracle after miracle. And that is not just for our edification. It is because he plans to do something with this church. And I believe that we are on the verge of something really exciting. I urge you earnestly to be part of what it is that God has planned for this church and this community. Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your instruction. We thank you for your love, which is so evident through the Word of God. Lord, we thank you that you care about us who have nothing to offer. We know that we are this Samaritan woman and that we have nothing to be proud of in ourselves but you have gone out of your way to go through Samaria to reach us. Lord, help us to go through Samaria to reach somebody else. Help us to care enough about people. Help us to have the love of Christ in our hearts. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.